Friends, back this morning, beloved. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 9. Uh, for those of you that were here this morning, uh, Brother Kent had touched on touched on the topic. Uh, anybody see the news this week? Anybody see what the Supreme Court voted in? They put the death nail. Uh, if America wasn't already in trouble, they sure enough put the death nail in America by giving the land to the Sodomites the, all, the, all the way through the Bible, the, the Word of God. The Lord tells us to get rid of the Sodomites. Don't even let them be in your presence. But we have bowed down and made what is evil that which is acceptable. Psalms 9 in verse 17 is a very familiar passage that we know all so well. But we have to read it again because, beloved, people have ears to hear and they're not hearing. They are not hearing it. And it's inside the church. Churches are ordaining homosexual priests. They're ordaining homosexual ministers. They're marrying homosexual couples. The very thing that God says is an abomination to him that defiles the land the churches have embraced. So it's easy to see that the church is indeed the Laodicean church that Christ has warned us about. Lukewarm churches, it's neither hot nor cold. They're just kind of there. I pray to God that you don't find yourself in that church. I pray that you are in the living body, the body of Christ, which is holiness and righteousness. And you would seek to serve Him in the things that He stands for. And beloved, if you're standing for homosexual agendas, if you're standing for any of the abominable things, baby murder, we call it abortion or choice, all of those things are putting yourself, you're pitting yourself against the God of heaven. And I assure you, you will lose. For what men esteems highly is an abomination unto the Lord. Psalms 9 verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Help us, Father, in the blessed name of Jesus. Look, beloved, what we see today is we, the, the wickedness, the, uh, the evil that's in the world making its greatest challenge against good. And beloved, there is and there will be a falling away, just like the Bible has prophesied. People get so caught up, and Brother Ken alluded to it earlier, people put their Bibles down and say, enough's enough. I, I don't know what's right. I don't know who's right. We have the spirit of truth to teach us in the way of righteousness, to teach us the truth. You don't have to give up, but when you're listening to men and you're listening to men's churches and you're listening to the way that's acceptable with the world, then it's easy to see how you can be swept away. Because the world, the nations, they have forsaken God and they're going to be turned into hell. It is time that you come out from amongst them. You can live here and not be of here. Do you believe that? Amen. Because it's where you're at. It's, it's, it's what your heart is, where you're serving in spirit and in truth. Isaiah chapter 3 has something to say. Well, actually, let's begin in Isaiah chapter 1. Because... This has happened before. The, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. There's nothing new under the sun. You think today is the only problem that, uh, the only time that we've seen problems with sodomites or homosexuals? No, it's, it's been that way before. It was never acceptable to God, and it's not acceptable to God now. Neither will it ever be. It'll never be acceptable with God. God created men and man in the beginning, male and female created He them. He created them that way for a reason, to procreate. Not so men could, could gorge himself on his perverseness and the decadent lifestyles that men live, spitting in the face of Almighty, Holy, Righteous God. And that's exactly what man is doing. Man is shaking his fists in ultimate defiance against the God of heaven, the God of creation, saying we're going to do what we want to do. We know the outcome. We have read the outcome. It is with fire. As Peter told us, as the book of Revelation tells us, and fire is coming, beloved. Fire is coming because man, with all the warnings, still chooses to pull the covers up over his bed and not see the monster for what it is, but acts like if he closes his eyes, maybe perhaps it ain't in there. Beloved, the monster's there. Satan is not going away. Satan is fixing to be given his greatest time. And when he is given his greatest time, it is that, it is that time that, that if we are not gone already, if you have not died, if Christ has not returned for his bride, you must be grounded in the foundation of truth or else you will be swept away because everybody's doing it, right? Everybody says it's okay. And you are a lone voice, one in, in the middle of nobody that would stand up and oppose 
everybody else. They want you to be quiet. They want you to be silent. They want you to sit down, Christian, and hold your tongue. When the Bible says you are to be bold as lions, wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. But you are to speak. You are never given the opportunity. We are not called into salvation and been given this ministry of reconciliation to sit on our laurels. We are to pro- proclaim the message. We are to carry it forth. And with that message comes the warnings as well. Because those that will not turn, that will not repent, shall perish. And beloved, hell is real whether people choose to talk about it or not. You can go there whether you believe in it or not. Isaiah 1, beginning in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. He says from the head to the sole of the feet, from the very top, from the very position of prominence in America, from the president who ordains such homosexuality and supports it and endorses it and forces it down your throat. Same way with the murdering of all of our babies. He says, supports it, he endorses it, he's got a fixation upon it. All the way down to the soles of the foot, to the regular old people in the streets, they're sick. They've got a messed up way of looking at things. They see things with their own eyes instead of the eyes of God. Look in Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. The prophet Isaiah had a lot to say about these times, about these days. Remember now, beloved, evil's going to make its greatest challenge against good. And there will be a falling away. If you are not grounded in the spirit of truth, if you do not have the love of Christ in you, if His Spirit is not abiding inside you, you will be swept away. If you feel yourself identifying or even willing to tolerate this abominable attack against God, beloved, there's a chance you're already lost. If you can sympathize with homosexuals or with baby murderers, like they have a right to do that, then your mind may be given over. You may be reprobate. There is nothing in the Word of God that supports this behavior. Everything in the Word of God says put them out. The blood defiles the land. Sodomites defiles the land. So whether it be abortions or whether it be same-sex unions, whatever it is, just because man applauds it, and hells it to be something big, it's an abomination unto God. Regardless of what men would say. Though hen, join in hen. It doesn't matter if everybody on planet earth stands up and applauds this, which they will. It's still abomination to God and they're not going to go unpunished. You believe it? Amen. You best believe it, beloved. Thus saith the Lord. Isaiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. The show of their countenance, their, 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 their very person, the, the very thing that they put, what they let you see. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Well, beloved, what was the sin of Sodom? Well, we're told in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 48 through 50, that they had fullness of, they had fullness of bread. They had idleness of time. They had a lot of money, but yet they would not help their neighbors. Therefore, these curses, these things are allowed to take place there. People think Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of homosexuality. No. Homosexuality was the proof of the destruction that had already been given out in judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. So what we see in America, homosexuality is not bringing about the end of America. Homosexuality and the, and the supporting thereof it of the whole seemingly anybody with a brain is proof that the judgment is here and that the death knell is in the coffin for America. 
We are a byword. We are going to be a hissing. We are going to be an astonishment to the nations. This nation is not given a covenant, a national covenant like Israel is. America can and will fall. All nations are going to utterly supplant against Israel, as the Bible has already said. So we know America's not going to make it forever. We know it. But boy, we sure are fast to cut our nose off to spite our face, aren't we? Who are we trying to please? You're trying to please some demon-possessed people that actually think what they're doing is okay when they know not that they're sick and they need help. And if we really love people, we'd tell them the truth. But we're, instead of, we're, we're afraid of offending people. We're afraid of going to jail. We're afraid of being charged with hate crimes or whatever else. You better be willing to go to jail and die for your profession because it's going to get to that. So you need to make up your minds right now where it is that you stand. Because when push comes to shove, if you're not going to stand for the Lord, you'll fall for anything. If you're bowing before God, you can stand before anybody. Your faith will be given you. Look in Isaiah chapter 5. This is exactly what we see today. This is what we see today. And all this starts with deception. It all starts with deception with an indoctrination. They have been teaching our kids this garbage in middle school or, or, or in their, their preschool. If you're, if you're not fortunate enough to send your kids to private schools or if you're not diligent enough to homeschool your kids, then you're trusting your kids to the secular institutions and they're going to teach your kids what they want them to know. And they're teaching them alternative lifestyles. They're teaching them that this behavior which God says should be thrown out is acceptable. So kids grow up with mom and daddy. Why are you so hard against them? It's not that bad. Kids are their oppressors, the Bible says in Isaiah 3. That, that children, and that's something you see too. We see it in the fact that kids never go away. They grow up and they, they have children and they come back and they, they bring their problems to you. They bring their problems to you along with all their clothes and all their furniture and they pile up your houses. They're your oppressors. It's, it, it, we, we laugh at it, but it's Bible prophecy coming to pass. Used to a man would grow up and take pride in the fact that he was 17 or 18 years old and would go out and get a job and support his family. Nowadays, they want to lay up in the den or lay up in the basement and, and receive a check from all you working people because they feel entitled. They feel like because they were born in America, then they should live the American dream without ever busting a lick at it. The Word of God talks about those too. People are that are they're like the hinges on the doors in their bed. They just roll from one side to the other. They're so lazy that they won't even bring their forks to their mouth so that they might eat. We're there, beloved. We are there. We've got 50% of Americans that are working less than 50% supporting the other dead beats that want all the handouts. You think it ain't so? Oh, it is so. We're a truckload away from economic collapse. We're there. Only by the grace of God do we see in the Bible Belt here. That we, we seem, it seems like we're protected from it. And we are. If you serve God, and if you trust in Him, He'll provide for you. But beloved, when you get outside the Bible Belt, and you get into the rest of this cesspool we call a nation, there's spots that God's got His hand on because they're serving Him. But for the most part, He ain't even acknowledged. They might mention God, but you don't know who they're talking about. They could be talking about Satan for all that. They don't call upon Christ Jesus. Because after all, it's Him that the world crucified. It's Him that the world hates. It's Him that Jesus said you would be hated for. And last time I checked, we're the only ones that professes faith in Him as God. So we are the enemies. We're the enemies and the whole world looks down upon you because you're non-tolerant. Well, you're even bigoted because you hold to this old book and you hold to the traditions that's put therein. And you tell other people that what they're doing is wrong. Well, who are you to judge? Don't let people tell you that. You make a judgment to get in your car and come here. You make judgments every day. It is okay for you to rightfully judge. Christ didn't tell you not to judge, but he told you to judge using discernment. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The Bible calls it wicked. They're wicked. 
Wicked is the same same word we get from your lawn furniture that's, that stands for wicker. Wicker for, it's, it's a twisting. A twisting of values. A twisting of the way that you look at things. These people have already been identified by the spirit of truth. Nothing's catching God off guard. He knew these times these times were coming. He knew these people were going to be here. And they're rewarding evil for good. And they're saying, woe unto the good. And they're trying to lift up the bad. They're talking about you in our Christ as if he's a byword while promoting sodomy, bestiality, Necromancy, you name it, it's all okay with this sick, wicked, twisted world because this world has a twisted way of looking at something. They see something that is holy and pure and think that it's just terrible. It is just terrible that you would want to adhere to the words of God. It's just horrible. But it's acceptable to live loose, immoral, any way you want to live. Because after all, that's your right, ain't it? There's going to be great deception. If you look in Matthew chapter 24, we know that none of these things are a surprise. Evil is going to make its greatest challenge against good, and there will be a falling away. That means there are going to be, there, there's going to be people that are in churches right now, maybe even some of you, that when push comes to shove, you're going to take the side of the world. Because after all, when, you, when you're asked to give up your, your livelihood, when you're asked to give up your jobs, food to feed your kids, how many of us will actually trust in God to provide and how many of us will fold? I pray to God that your strength will not fail you, that your faith will not fail you in time of adversity, and that your faith is indeed given to you by God Himself. To as many as have received Him, to them gave He power to become children of God. If you have been given that power by God, you're not going to falter. But if yours is a superficial faith, if it's just something that you're doing with your own intellect and with your own trying to understand, you're going to fail. Because man's wisdom is foolishness unto God. And, and there's nobody going to be able to outthink the great thinker. For lack of better terms, he entered a perfect paradise and brought sin there. He'll come into a fallen, dark, black world and blur the truth so much that you'll jump onto it. You must be grounded in the truth. Christ says in verse 20, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 and 4, it says, And as he sat, as Christ sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Because Jesus, they had been showing him the temples and, and, and how great man's building was. And Christ said, All these things are going to fall. He said, All these things are going to be thrown down. There ain't going to be nothing left standing here. One stone upon another. And that prophecy that he was given to that temple actually came to pass in 70 A.D. Under Titus, the, the Roman emperor, when they actually ripped down all the stones of the temple because the fires were so hot that the gold of all the vessels there was inside the stone. So they took it down stone by stone to get all the gold out. It's just like Christ said. He said, this is what Christ said in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Why? Because people listen to men. People, beloved, there are churches out here that amass numbers in the thousands. In the thousands. There's never any conviction. There's never any repentance preached. There's never any, any faith in the blood preached. It's all a smells good, looks good, sounds good, fuzzy type atmosphere where motivational speaking takes place and they are false converts and they are false shepherds. Broad is the way, beloved. Many are there at which leads to destruction. So if, if the whole world is pushing and pressing towards something, that should be a signal within your own spirit that you should be going the other way. Right? It is smooth going with the flow. When you go down a handrail, you take a handrail at your house and you walk down it for 40 years and you rub your hand on it, it's slick. It's slick as owl grease. But you turn around and go against the grain and you get full of splinters and briars. 
And that's what this world has to offer you. Splinters and briars. Thorns and thistles. Why do you think Christ wore a crown of thorns, beloved? Because it represents man's sin, and it was firmly placed upon his head that if you would put your faith in him, your sin would be carried for you. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is also something that Paul has alluded to. He didn't really just allude to it. He preached on it. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We see this today. Anybody, beloved, if you can sit in a church that has a homosexual priest, if you can sit in a church that condones the marriage of homosexuals, you, beloved, are at at war against God. The proper response would be to get up and walk out and never go back again. Because if that spirit of tolerance is there, then that spirit of Satan is there and not the spirit of truth. That sounds hard. Isn't Christ loving and forgiving? Yes, He is for those that put their faith in Him. But we're told by the Spirit of Truth in the epistles in John that these people out there in the world that He doesn't want you to pray for. That sounds hard. Go read 1 John again, beloved. There's sin out there. There's people that blaspheme the Holy Ghost. We're told not even to pray for them. You can tell by the stances they take, Romans 1, that they have a reprobate mind. If they have a reprobate mind, God has given them up to think whatever they want to think. And when man relies on his own ability, they're damned. They've been left up to their own reprobate minds. In other words, anything that man or woman will ever do, they have got themselves convinced that it's all right with God. Because after all, God forgives everything. He forgives everything for those that are in Him. He doesn't forgive everything for those with a false profession just so they can live however life they want to live. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Remember your conscience? We did a few years back is your ability to discern between what is right and what is wrong. And if that discernment has been seared with a hot iron, then then that discernment has left you. You don't have the ability to discern between what is right and what's wrong. Doesn't matter if everybody in the body of Christ is telling you that's wrong in your pride, you're gonna say, Well, I feel like it's right. So as long as I feel like it's right, it all that matters is how I feel. The very words of your mouth is going to be what condemns you, beloved. By your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. It is by the stances that people take. There is no room for, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no... There's no room in this day, there is no room in this time for passiveness. You know, 20 years ago, people that were possessed with demons knew something was wrong with them. They were ashamed of the state that they found themselves in. They didn't understand it was a spiritual attack and that it was spiritual warfare a lot of times because people like to sugarcoat stuff. They didn't understand that they had a possession. They didn't know. They still don't know. But at least then, the people, their morality, the overall moral of the people was enough to keep them convinced that they needed to hide what they were doing. But now we see the prophecy of Isaiah come to pass. They hide it not. They declare their sin openly in Sodom and Gomorrah. They declare it and they want you to take pride in it too. They have hijacked the rainbow, God's covenant with the people that had never destroyed them by the flood again. And they took it for their own wicked, twisted, perverted agendas. And now they use a rainbow to represent their wickedness. To wear a child or, a, or somebody can't even wear colors that mix more than three together. Because if you do, it may be misconstrued that you're supporting their abominable lifestyles. You can't even enjoy a rainbow no more. Wickedness, perverseness, twisting of what is true. And we as a body and we as a church, we stand by and we do what? We say nothing. We don't want to be the stogie. We don't want to be the stuffed, stuffy one that's speaking out and calling a duck a duck. Beloved, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And you can call it what it is. The reason these things are happening is because we, beloved, as a body, as a church, are not doing our jobs. 
God is going to give the people rulers that represent the overall morale and the overall outlook of the people. We have rulers that support the slaughtering of innocents, the, the, the blood of the innocent babies. We have rulers that accept that and not only accept it, but have you paying for it via your taxes. Their blood is on your hands as well because our tax dollars pay for it. And there ain't none of us standing up there saying, no, no, I don't want this. We all just take everything coming every day lying down. This same sex union that gets passed, you say, well, that's not on me. It is on you. To you who knows to do right and doeth it not, to you is sin. You say, well, you want me to get in trouble. I don't want you to get in anything. I want you to trust in God and start declaring His words. If your time is meant with jail, if it was if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it may be good enough for you. It's not God doesn't want to keep you out of prison necessarily. He may want you to be there. If God would have you to die for your faith, is that so much to ask? After all, He died for ours. Whatever you are called to do, you should not back away from. And you should not be afraid of anything that man has to do unto you. We're told these things are coming. Look in Ephesians. Uh, actually, go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because this is what we see. We see these people, they go to what they're calling church. Right, they're meeting by the thousands in different meeting places all over, and they're calling it church. They sing praises. They give their money to their offering plate. But their hearts, the what they believe, what they think, what they practice, is wickedness. You can go and worship. You can go and sing. You can go and tithe. You can go do whatever you want to do, beloved. And if you are not found in Christ, you're going to be those that are without. Didn't we? Preaching your name, teaching your name, and your name cast out devils. And Christ going to say, I never knew you. Christ is not going to lose any. People are not coming to him. People are not preaching the gospel. People are not coming to him. Instead, instead, of, instead of hearing the truth, they want to hear those lies that make them feel better. They want to walk away feeling puffed up and good about themselves. Beloved, the reality of the situation is this world is sick. This world is damned in its present state. And the reality of the matter is there's only one way to escape it. His name is Christ Jesus. That's the only way to escape it. It's to be in Him. And you may still suffer because it's appointed unto you not only to believe in Christ Jesus, but also to suffer for Him. Philippians 1.29 So the fact that you believe could be your, your, your penalty, your suffering. It, it could be a sentence written out against you. But is that one you're willing to take? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. The covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. It means they're going to have all kind of twisted, perverted affections. They're false accusers or they're truth breakers. They're false accusers. They're incontinent. They're, it means they have no self-control. You, you hear people, like they say, I, I just can't help myself. I just can't help myself. They have no self-control. Because they have, through the exercising of sin and the practices of sin, they have become hardened. And, and the ability for them to show any kind of restraint has gone. And also the will or the want to show any kind of restraint. I just say, like, Jesus can save me as good as you and, and I'm saved. And you're not saved, beloved, if that is your attitude. Paul said, study to show thyself approved. He said, diligently, diligently contend for the faith. He never at one time told you to take the name of your God in vain, which you've read the writings of Solomon in the 30th proverb. And by somebody not doing the will of God, they're taking God's name in vain. You think it's just something that you say. Now, beloved, the Word of God teaches us otherwise. You can take the name of your God in vain by calling upon His name 
professing His name and then living ungodly or living to your own lust and your own flesh. Like that's hard, beloved. He said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many is going to seek entry, they're not going to be able to. They're not going to be able to find it. Why not? Because you're going on your own intellect, you're going on man's teachings, you're going on your own wisdom. If you do not go by the door, you're not getting in. He says they're traitors, they're heady, they're high-minded. Oh, the last part of that verse 3, it says they're despisers of those that are good. So if you're good, not you in and of yourselves, but you being in Christ and Christ being in you makes you good. It also makes you an enemy to the world. They're going to despise you. Christ said in John in the 16th chapter, they're going to come a time that people's going to kill you and they're thinking that they're doing God's service. Verse 5 says that they're, they're having a form of godliness, but they're denying the power thereof from such turn away. If you got somebody beloved, you, you say, well hey, they profess to be Christians. It doesn't matter. If they have a form of godliness and they're denying the power thereof. If they can sit and read a set of passages that says this very thing, the sodomites are to be put out. Those that shed, shed innocent blood are to be put out from your land. And we accept them and we let them in. We'll say, oh, beloved, you are partakers of their sin. You know to do right and you're doing it not. You are just like them. We're told that we're to turn them away. Turn them out. Turn them away. They've heard the truth and they've denied the truth. You've got preachers that will accept this kind of behavior. You've got preachers that practice this kind of behavior. Openly. And they still hold a job. When the body of Christ could kick them so far out of the church that they don't never land. But instead, we just band-aid everything and let everything be acceptable. And we're going to have God to answer to for it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Nothing new. Nothing new. Why does this happen? This is why it happens. It's the same poison at another time and it is in a different bottle. It doesn't matter what time you're in. It all gets down to the truth and the lie. It all gets down to the truth and the lie. The truth is, all men are sinners. The truth is that by the works of the law, there will no flesh be justified. The truth is that there was only one without sin. The lie is that it doesn't matter. There is no standards. There is no requirements. All you got to do is repeat after me. Show me that in the Word of God. Show me, repeat after me in the Word of God. You know what you're going to find? You won't find that. You'll find repent. You'll find forsake that old man. You'll find confess Christ. Believe in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. You'll find being baptized in his name. You will not find repeat after me in the word of God. But since the truth is put away and we're motivational speakers now, Paul could write this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 beginning in verse 3. Actually, back up to verse 2, he says, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do the things that we're not doing in the church today. I'm not talking about ours. I'm talking about it in Ecclesiastes as a, as a whole. The churches are not preaching the Bible. You're going to church for 40 minutes and you're getting two verses read to you. And then you'll get seven steps or three steps of man's intellect and man's wisdom, which takes away from the very words that they're reading. Verse 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me anything that makes me uncomfortable, that makes me look at myself. Tell me something that's going to send me out of here feeling good about myself and the life I'm living. Verse 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But because of that thing, the truth is offensive to them. I know that I'm not an eloquent speaker. I know that. And I know that, that my style, I wouldn't listen to me. But God sees it fit that by me the words of His, of his gospel are declared. It ain't about to speak. He's just doing that to show you it has nothing to do with the mule doing the speaking. If he'll use somebody like me, he'll use anybody. It ain't about the preachers. It's about the words that you carry. It. And when the words that you carry are his, they're not yours, you're his servant. You're his servant. 
He tells us these things are coming. He tells us that they're going to have teachers and they're going to want them to just tell them what they want to hear. Now, every time you'll see, and hey, a duck's a duck, it's a duck. Every time you'll see Joel Osteen's church, they'll hold up their Bible before they start. This is my Bible, so on and so forth. Then they commit to laying their Bibles down and never open them up again for the rest of the time they're there. What is that? What is that? It's motivational speakers just telling somebody what they want to hear. God could care less about your IRAs and your money that you laid up for some time down the road. The Bible tells us not to do that thing because you're trusting in uncertain riches. It's not that He has anything against you having anything. He's got something against you putting your trust there. You see what I'm saying? It's okay to have things, beloved. It's okay to have money and to be financially secure. But it's wrong to trust in that. You trust in the God that provides you that and it will always be there. If you acknowledge Him, He'll direct your path. But you've got to be acknowledge Him. If you're not acknowledging in Him, then you're going on your own. Look in Titus chapter 1. Verse 16. They, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and under every good work reprobate. Reprobate means rejected. Rejected. Just like silver that is, that is being purified. If it's reprobate, it's rejected. It's thrown out. So the people profess to know God. They, yeah, I'm a Christian. But in their way and in their lives and in the things that they're doing, they're abominations to Him because in their little votes that they're taking, the Supreme Court or anybody else, they're supporting the very things that He says is abominable. It's an abomination to Him. And they'll walk away from there feeling all right and feeling safe because judgment doesn't come right then and there. But judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. We see, judgment is coming faster than you can ever imagine, beloved. I know you've been hearing it your whole life. I know. I know some of you even took the mindset that Peter warns about. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are. Where's the promise of His coming? I can tell you something, beloved. If you can't see the promises of His coming and the prophecies that are unfolding before our eyes, you're blind. He's coming. He's coming, and wrath is coming with Him. It ain't the, the Lamb that got crucified that's returning, beloved. It's the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. And judgment is on His mind, and judgment is what He's going to do. You'll either be in Him, or you will be swept away with the rest of the wicked. Second Peter chapter 2, which uh, is very... This very thing, this actually, the whole, the whole chapter, beginning in verse 12, 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, says, These were as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with you or with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They, 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 they carry themselves around with their own deceptions and they'll be sitting right beside you in church. And you won't know unless you put the pressures on the right spot. That they really oppose to everything you stand for. And they're looking at ways to take you down and to take you out whenever they can. These people out there in the world, they call you brother, they call you sister. That hopes you trip and fall and they hope they can be there when you do. You think I'm lying? The world's like that. The world hates you because of Christ that's in you. It's got nothing against you. Don't take it personally. It's got nothing against you personally. It's the Jesus that's in you that they hate. It's to Jesus that's in you that they reject. You shouldn't marvel when the world hates you or when those people around you persecute you. You should rather praise His name for that. You can go on through this whole Second Peter, and he gets down to verse 22 or 20 through 22 says, "For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome." Key phrase, the latter end. Excuse me, is worse 
with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow or the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So you see, beloved people, they come near. They come ever so close to the truth. They hear the truth. They understand how it is to, to, to be washed, to, to be clean, that they're to escape all these coming things. And they turn away from it. And they go right back to the world that they came from. Because they don't, they don't, they don't want to quit. They don't want to stop. And how dare you say that they are wrong? Who are you to judge, right? How many times have you heard that lame expression thrown in your face? 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that, thou shall come, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of the coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, All things are created by Him. And, and, and for His pleasure were all things created. And, and verse 17 says, And by Him, by the word, all things consist or is held, held together. Well, that's what Peter picks up. By, by that same word, Verse 7, they're kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So we see the things that are now, and, and people, they keep thinking, well, hey, God's okay with this, we're still here. No, He's holding everything together just for the judgment that's coming. If He turned us over to our own demise, we'd already destroyed one another by now. He holds it together because the judgment, vengeance is His. That's what the Word of God says. Vengeance belongeth to the Lord. Now, at first, uh, look in Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. Hebrews chapter 12. I believe we're going to be wrapping it up right here. Evil is making its greatest challenge against good, beloved. And there will be a fallen Way we've already seen it. How many people do you know in your lives, in your body, in your church that that don't go to church no more, that don't serve God no more? They might profess Him, but they live life however they want to. They don't serve Him. If the Spirit of God is in you, you're going to serve Him. You're going to worship Him. You can't help but. If you can walk away from said service or said worship, it ain't His Spirit that's in you. But maybe your own. How many people have we seen leave? How many people have we seen fall away? And I'm not talking about from living waters, Bible church. I'm talking about from the body of Christ altogether. How many people have we seen profess a faith in Him and then they're, they're, they, do, they do their own thing? They're right back into the mud, as the Bible says. They never were saved, beloved. They don't have a genuine saving faith. They're that seed that sprung up quickly. On the stony ground, it had no soil, had no root. And as soon as that sun and the heat comes up, it withered us away and it dies. Because we're not founded in the truth. We're not founded in the gospel. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. Follow peace, beloved, with all men. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently... Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You see what he says? Looking diligently. That is, that is you are to use every effort that you've got. You are to use every means available. To, to make sure you are to study to show thyself approved. You, you're not to ever take anything for granted. Second Corinthians 13. We'll read one more passage. This, this should be a verse that you have got highlighted, that you've got underlined, that you study and pray upon. Remember what Christ said? Brother Kent read it to us this morning in Luke 21, verse 36. 
Pray yourselves always worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We are told to pray ourselves always worthy. Same thing Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. He says, examine yourselves. What does he mean? Look at yourself. Study yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. You can know whether or not you're in the faith. You can know whether or not you're in the faith by the way you take stance. Well, what stances or, or however what I've said today, however it flies, whether it's acceptable with you or the things I've said have angered you. If the things I've said has angered you, 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 you don't have the Spirit of God. Because it's been thus said the Lord. So we're to examine ourselves. We're to look at ourselves. To, to, to know our own selves, that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So Jesus is in you, except you're rejected. If you're rejected, obviously Christ ain't with you. And he tells you to examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. You can examine yourself by the words that you've heard today. You can examine yourself by the word throughout the word of God. You have a love for the word of God? Can you not wait to get up and read the Word of God? If you long for the Word of God in your daily lives, if you want to eat that bread of life every day, that's a pretty good sign. If you never want to pick up the Word of God, if the Word of God is boring or stale to you, His Spirit ain't in you. You said, man, that's quick. Hey. If the Spirit of the Holy God that created all things is inside you, then your little mere mortal bodies cannot can, can contain all that power in that Spirit. And your Spirit is going to want to edify itself through the Spirit of truth, the reading of the Word of God. Because after all, you can pray to your blue in the face and you're talking to God. When you read His words, He's talking to you. So if you're not reading His words, you're not hearing from God. And if you're hearing voices and other things, then you need, to, you need prayer altogether different. There are a lot of spirits in this world. There is deception on every corner. And beloved, don't listen to voices in the world. Listen to the written, finished word of truth that needs not added to nor taken away. Those that's coming with new revelations, new dreams and visions, Muhammad had those. He created Islam. John Smith had those. He created the Mormon religion. All those are extra biblical visions that do not line up with the Word of God. So if you're receiving anything extra biblical, if you're hearing voices, if you're seeing things, you need to pray harder. You need to draw close to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. But the only way you're going to hear from God is if you're reading his words. Doesn't matter what anybody says, beloved. That's the written, finished Word of God. And it doesn't need added to. So if it, the Bible says it's complete and it's finished, then there ain't anything else coming to you. You have everything you need right here. Ground yourself there. Stand on His words or you're going to fall. And it's coming. Destruction and deception that's sweeping this nation seemingly overnight. Questions or comments about the assault on the, by the wicked? It's coming.